She's an actor, filmmaker, and mental health advocate with over 155 awards and nominations to her name. Sean Riley joins me in 25 seconds on an all new RXG exclusive. We must open up our minds and take a look inside. I bet we find we hold all the answers tonight. You're watching RXG exclusives. October is National Depression and Mental Health Screening Month, with Mental Illness Awareness Week taking place at the top of the month. My guest often explores psychological and social issues through the art of cinema in a visceral and poetic manner. Sean Riley, thank you for making the time. <laughs> thank you for having me. For the past couple of years, our projects have been circling the festival circuit, and uh, it's always wonderful to see such evocative and necessary material being recognized. Let me congratulate you on camera for all of your success. Thank you so much. Yeah, our paths have crossed many times. As an actor, you go to emotional and sometimes dark places, and in your writing you often do the same. What inspires you to probe such issues, and is it difficult to step away from that place once there's a fade out on the page or the director calls cut? Um, I decided that I wanted to delve into stories that I find are important to tell. Uh, so it isn't so much about me, it's about kind of the audience and everyone else and the type of stories that I feel are important for them to see portrayed on the screen. So while I think it's a little bit therapeutic for me uh, as an actor and writer, at the same time, I'm telling stories for other people, not just for myself. So I kind of have to go into that place of these important stories and, and delve into the origins of where all of our experiences come from and uh, the kind of stories that are important to tell. So when I do, I've actually never typed fade out, I'll be honest. <laughs> I just kind of like leave it open-ended. Um, that's how I operate. And uh, stepping away, yeah, it can be hard because you do become so engrossed in the story and the importance of what you're trying to tell. But at the same time, it's something you're going to carry with you for a few years anyway um, into development and production and all of that. So it is a little difficult to step away, but at the same time, it's a process. So you're not stepping away immediately and you kind of carry that with you. And it's just all a part of the process. That makes sense. And I think fade in and fade out are arguably obsolete these days, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of writers that do use it. I never have. I just, I have not because I don't like my stories to end, so to speak. Now you have a bachelor's degree in film and a master's in psychology. How does that graduate degree aid in your understanding of the human condition? That's a good question. Um, I've always been interested in human beings and how they operate, as well as the experiences that we take with us from our childhoods into adulthoods. And um, it's it's kind of aided in, in the fact that it helps me understand uh, the clinical way that things happen. And then also the observations that I make in other people kind of putting those links together. So I think it's important to have um, both of those degrees kind of meet in my projects. Now, television and cinema is obviously meant to entertain, but creatives like yourself are also educating and inspiring and making people reevaluate. I mentioned that your work has a poetic feel. Is that intentional? And how do you provoke viewers without being preachy? The funny thing is a lot of people tell me my work is poetic and I had never thought of it uh, in that regard until people had been pointing it out and they still point it out. And then I'm like thinking of how uh, what I'm trying to portray, how it actually comes across to other people. And I think it kind of is subconscious, but at the same time, also intentional, if that makes sense. When I get to the editing room on my short films, for example, every single shot, every single decision, every single image, it's very intentional. And so I think that is kind of the poetic aspect that people are gathering from my work and how they put it together is that it comes from a sub subconscious place, but then when I actually lay it out, it is very conscious. And obviously short films and feature films differ in some ways, but do you approach the writing process differently? 
I do. Um, my feature films all come from very real incidents in my life. And I like them to come across more like a typical narrative, whereas shorts kind of give me that room to explore creatively and more explore uh, things that come from my dreams and conversations with other people. So I take a little bit more liberty uh, when it comes to the artistic side of my short films. Um, however, I do gather my experiences for my features from my lucid dreaming abilities. So it just kind of takes everything that's been roaming around in my mind from my experiences and ideas and puts them together for my features. Whereas my short films, <clears throat> excuse me, I kind of just sit down and type them out uh, kind of in a stream of consciousness. Now, little birdies tell me that you once had a career as a flight attendant. What I did. What many experiences did you have there that inspired your work? Because I'm sure you came across people from all walks of life. Yeah, if you ever want to observe human beings, that is the career path you want to go into. Um, because you do, you meet people that come from all kinds of uh, places, walks of life, different experiences. And the funny thing is, you can gather a lot about people, even in a, you know, four hour flight. Uh, but I actually took one of my experiences as a flight attendant, and I turned it into a feature film. And that is my script, uh, Volley Nocturne. I should say we are in um, the development stages of that feature film. But I took uh, an experience I had as a flight attendant here in Las Vegas before I, I had ever lived here. And I turned it into more of a story that I think also has an importance uh, to deal with human trafficking. Oh, wow. So that's yeah. interesting because I, I, I've i gone on many road trips with my family and sometimes I, go, I would go to the restroom, the rest stop, and on the inside of the stall would be signs to call if you felt someone was being trafficked. But I never really thought about people being trafficked in the skies. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. We actually, uh, in flight attendant training, we had a whole training section on human trafficking. And so when I went through this experience um, that is in my screenplay, now I took a lot of liberties to, to make it into a story as the, you know, what if I wasn't aware of uh, a situation where I was potentially being human trafficked, but I had just come out of flight attendant training. So I already had that knowledge with me to recognize like, oh, this is a situation that is not good and could potentially turn into that. And we do have those signs in all of our bathroom stalls here in Las Vegas too, because it's, it's kind of a hub, if you will, for that kind of activity, but it can happen literally anywhere. Wow. Very interesting. Well, I wrote a book called Cold Night in a Warm Season. In it, a young graduate screenwriter is struggling to navigate loss, success, failure, self-identity, insecurities, and so much more. Some folks find it difficult to comprehend why a writer feeling that his or her work is unappreciated or an actor not booking a job is worth their empathy. Oh, there are more important things to worry about, an outsider might say. But I personally feel that we're all entitled to our own feelings and emotions. Do you find that artists or creative types are especially vulnerable to mental health challenges? And if so, why? That's a good question. Um, I hadn't thought of it that way, but yes, I, I think we are very vulnerable because we are vulnerable human beings in putting ourselves out there and trying to express ourselves. And it's not always actors or screenwriters telling their own stories, which you and I do, but there are also those creatives where maybe their path is trying to tell other people's stories and they want to do a, a good job of portraying that to the audience. So yeah, I think we're definitely more vulnerable. Um, and that's, that's a topic that I have written about in some of my screenplays, including my feature film, Better, um, that we will hopefully be going into production in the next several months. Um, that deals with mental health and being vulnerable with other human beings. And then my short film, You Don't Deserve This, which is my current short on the festival circuit, definitely deals with uh, the insecurities and um, vulnerability that we have with expressing ourselves with other human beings. Our line of work can be exhausting stressful, giving us days where we question why we're even pursuing this. Right. Since I began in this business, I've prided myself on never waiting for the industry to call my name. And I always tell folks to follow my lead, grab that notebook, that camera, that iPhone, make your art. You have not allowed an industry and world where women have to fight harder than they should to get you down. 
Using yourself as an example, how does one build opportunities for themselves and others? I always like to say to let the work speak for itself. So yeah, we have those challenges where, you know, we come across some of our colleagues in the industry that are like, you know, hey, you're a survivor, you're still in this. And most people would have given up a long time ago, but it's my calling. There's nothing else I want to do. So if you have that extreme burning desire inside of you to tell stories, that's what you have to do. And you have to not listen to other people, just focus on what you're doing, not what everyone else is doing, not what's trendy in the industry now, not the challenges you're facing. Deal with yourself, know your abilities and trust in them and just pursue it anyway. And that calling you mentioned, when did you discover that? Was that oh, gosh. something happened in your childhood or something more recently? Yeah, it was definitely in my childhood. Um, I would say probably around the age, well, around six, I got into uh, ballet. And then I eventually went into professional training two years later. Um, but I knew I was going to be an entertainer and performer from a very young age. And um, I kind of took it more seriously when I was in fourth grade. I was this uh, strange child that wrote to universities and said, hey, can I join your acting program? Wow. And they're like, yes, give us, you know, like another decade and a half or so and then come back and find us again. <laughs> but I just wanted to make sure that I was putting myself out there like, hey, I exist and this is what I'm going for. And that's what I still do to this day. I still put my name out there like, hey, I have these abilities. If you can use me, you know where to find me. <laughs> That's amazing. You had that kind of confidence at such a young age. Yeah. And, and it's something that, you know, yeah, I doubt myself too. We all doubt ourselves in this industry because it's not an easy one. But at the same time, I know what my abilities are. I just have to convince other people what my abilities are because they don't know. And it sounds like you're a very collaborative individual. How do you create long lasting relationships with people that just want to create really good storytelling? I like to um, make sure to build solid, meaningful relationships with people in this industry. Now, I met uh, a fellow producer of mine on my projects uh, back when we were doing background acting, actually. We ended up crossing paths on three different sets. And then, you know, he developed a career into producing. And then I developed more screenwriting and my, more on my acting and directing. And then, you know, I kind of like utilize people where I see what they're doing. They're putting themselves out there for their work and I'm doing the same. And it's just kind of like our paths converge, like, Hey, we keep in touch. And like, are you looking to create something like this? Yeah, let's go. So I like those people that are very proactive about their careers, but also not delusional about how they fit in within the industry. They just want to create art and they want to do a good job. So people that have a good skill set that come into a project uh, no issues. We all just collaborate and want to make something great. So those are the kind of relationships that I like to foster. Makes sense. Well, you know, the world has changed in the last couple of years. Many different events have really reshaped the entire foundation. Have you found that your art has been impacted and affected by that? And how? Yeah, that's an understatement. Actually, uh, we were set to... Um, go into pre-production on my feature film better uh, right before the pandemic started. And we had like a timeline that where it was just about to go into that active pre-production. And I had done most of the pre-production work that I could myself before I brought other people on board um, because I like them to see my abilities and be able to trust in that. And then that was kind of shattered with a pandemic as you know everybody's lives were disrupted. So I didn't want to think of it as a me issue but at the same time, I was like, how can I continue making art to come out of this pandemic eventually and be in a good place? And that's when I took on my short films, uh, Question Everything, and You Don't Deserve This. And I you know, found those individuals that were willing to collaborate and keep going. Uh, instead of you know, dwelling on our woes and, and the state of the world, uh, there's only so much you can control. And in, in my position, it was my art. So I just kept making art in, in the way that I could at the time. 
Well, Sean, how do you balance it all? Is that an ever-evolving thing? I, I imagine there's a lot of different things happening in your life at one time. You're a very busy person. <laughs> I always like to say I'm the busiest person I know. But the thing is, I like to keep busy. So I think that's the difference between being busy and feeling like you have all of these obligations and responsibilities. I like to keep busy and keep moving forward. So there's always something I'm working on for my films, even if you don't see it. It could be a lot of the business side on the feature, for example, that takes up a lot of my time. Uh, and then developing these future projects that I also have um, that I can't really go into until I complete that feature. So I'm always doing something. I'm always answering questions for other creatives that come to me on a daily basis, uh, wanting help with their projects or maybe just answering questions about the acting business or something like that. But I'm constantly doing something. I'm coaching actors, trying to, trying to just help people the best way that I can in the industry until my stuff is able to move forward too. So I just like that forward momentum to keep going. Well, Sean, please tell viewers what you have coming up next and how they can support what you do. Well, I'm working on that actually because some of the projects are still in film festivals, so I can't release them publicly yet. But occasionally I do enter film festivals where there is an opportunity to view them online because I know not everyone can get to festivals still. Um, it's, and it's not just a pandemic issue, it's more, you know, a cost issue. Uh, so I try to kind of occasionally throw out like an opportunity to, hey, maybe I'll be able to get to show this to people online in the meantime. But yes, I'm, I'm trying to formulate a plan because I have a few different shorts that link together and I still have to make a couple of those. So then I will release them all at the same time. But in the meantime, people can catch me on Instagram at Sean Riley and I put out stuff on there all the time, especially my stories. And Sean, before you go, is there anything else you'd like to share with viewers? I know you've mentioned some of your upcoming projects. Anything else you might want to put out into the universe that you think is pertinent? Yeah, I think um, for female filmmakers especially, you know, we're all in this together. Uh, people that come from those less fortunate opportunity backgrounds in this industry, we're all a team. We're not competing against each other. And that's something that I find often when I meet other new filmmakers is that they, they want to be the one that breaks the glass ceiling, right? But we all have to do it together. If we want to change those numbers, we all have to collaborate. We all have to cheer each other on. We can't just be the one person as much as we may want to. It's We all have to do it in order to create that, that positive lasting change. And let me just piggyback off of that real quick. So what can we men do to make things better in this industry and, and in this world? I know that's a loaded question. Yeah, but it's a great one because I, you know, as much as I like to push for female uh, filmmakers, BIPOC filmmakers, um, I still surround myself with very supportive men that are willing to stand beside me and w make work with me. My teams do tend to be mostly men um, because that's the way the numbers are stacked, but also I have found men to be uh, more receptive to wanting to collaborate than female filmmakers, although I hope that changes. I would like to have more women on my team and I'm working on that. Um, but, you know, we all have these important stories to tell. And so I think what men can do is really just be supportive of saying, you know, how can I help you on a project? You know, what can I bring that will help you in, in being able to elevate your journey as well? And then, you know, we work together. I, you know, it's not that women filmmakers don't want to work with men. It's just that we're trying to find a way where they're willing to work beside and with us and not you know, not just lead, but also work collaboratively with us. It's been fantastic spending a little time with you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was finally great to officially meet you this way. And, you know, our paths have crossed so many times on the festival circuit, which has been amazing. So this has been a wonderful experience. Thanks, Robert. And thank you for watching RXG Exclusives. I'm Robert X. Goffin. Until next time. RXG Exclusives. Hello, I'm Robert X. Golfin. Winner of Outstanding TV Host, Robert X. Golfin. And to know you is to love you because you're such a great dude. Well, listen, we're going to talk about your feet and other topics, but I want to take it back to your childhood first. My mom and my wife's stepfather, he was actually an Italian mafia in the Philadelphia. What do you want your work to say about you? I think something that I'm really interested in is masculinity. Outstanding TV director, podcast series. But I want to make people think about things differently than they do. Outstanding soundtracks, 
U N I by Bryant McKnight Jr. Nominated for Best Series, Best Reality Series or Podcasts, Award of Excellence in TV and Film, Best TV Episode, and Best Producer TV Series. RXG Exclusives, now in production on the season's final episodes. Make sure to like, comment, and hit subscribe on our YouTube channel so you never miss out. RXG Exclusives, hosted by Robert X. Golfin, now playing.